Coming up next on this week in computer hardware, get the best GPU settings for your games automatically. Got a grand for a great gaming GPU? You'll love NVIDIA's GTX 690. There's a GTX 670 on the way, a mil-spec ruggedized SSD, iPad, heat issues, cheap Korean 1440 monitors, and quite a bit more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch this week in computer hardware, episode 168, recorded May 3rd, 2012. Adam's dead. Long live the 690. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code TWITCH5. And they now offer free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm your host, Patrick Norton, joined, as always, by Mr. Ryan Shroud of PCPro.com. This is the show, ladies and gentlemen, where we try to bring you the biggest and most important stories in computer hardware. We tuck into the tablets occasionally, and of course, we're going to answer some of your viewer questions after the break. But right now, joining me from beautiful Kentucky, Mr. Ryan Shroud. How's it going, man? Uh, I'm going all right. I'm, I'm doing okay, and it's going okay. Uh, <laughs> it's it's been a hectic week. We I moved to Austin and then flew back home because I just needed to be in the office space to do Twitch. That's not actually the case, uh, but that's what it appears like. We had to do a couple of things, so I, I flew back home, and now I will fly back to Austin, Texas tomorrow. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say next week we'll be I'll be recording from Austin, <laughs> Texas. So we'll see how that goes. The land of the delicious barbecue. I did. I did find one place to have barbecue for the three two and a half days I was there, and it was amazing. So I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to go back now. So I'm looking forward to watching you grow slightly wider week by week for the two. I'm not looking forward to that at all. That's that's a horrible <laughs> idea, actually. Portion control, exercise are the two keys to surviving. Uh, I am good extent. at neither of these things. You're duped, man. Um, it's slightly more cheerful news. Uh, 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 the company I work for, before anybody asks, uh, in the chat room was bought by Discovery. So Revision 3 is now uh, a part of Discovery. Uh, and that's about all I know about it. So we're looking forward to it uh, here cool. at Revision 3. And uh, I think this makes me a, like a, 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 a work cousin to Micro and the Mythbusters. Which Does that make is, you uh, feel pretty good? That makes me pretty warm and fuzzy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. should. That's awesome. That's awesome pretty as those guys are but at least you know they're not a lot they'll prettier. fix you up the movie magic <laughs> and all that stuff right that's that's all it is it's all they fix it in post just like chad does <laughs> weird release today we've we teased it last week we've we've known about it for a couple weeks uh, the nvidia geforce dtx 690 dual gk 104 kepler greatness which immediately makes me want to say something snarky like, hey, will you be able to buy a GTX 690 before the GTX 680 finally starts shipping again? Is that just too now, cruel for me? <laughs> now, we don't, we don't want to get into that yet. I mean, that's, let's, <laughs> let's wait for the snarky discussion until the end. So this, this okay. is the 690. I think, did we actually show this last week? No, I didn't have it last week. So you this know, is the you, 690. You showed it on uh, Texilla last week. That's you right. That's it. what it was. Um, and so what's really cool about this is the design is actually... A pretty important part of it. So uh, let me see if I can remember all the key words here. Uh, the silvery part here is actually cast aluminum uh, with a trivalent chromium plating. And uh, a trivalent chromium plating makes it uh, very resistant to scratches and damage uh, and apparently increases uh, the thermal properties of it. And then the housing around the fan is actually uh, injection molded uh, magnesium alloy. Right, so there's very little plastic on the device. And then the, the, this right here is actually polycarbonate windows. So you can see the vapor chambers that cool each GPU. So it's actually a very kind of interesting uh, design. It's not your standard plastic card. Um, it's not cheap looking. It's actually very kind of sleek and interesting. And then at the top here, if you see this, 
what you're looking at is uh, the GeForce GTX logo up top there. It actually has like a rubberized texture, but it is also it has an LED that is controllable through software. So uh, mm -hmm. during our large live stream today, Tom Peterson was here from NVIDIA and he demoed uh, the light. You could manually set the brightness anywhere from off to full. You could have it change based on the clock speeds. You could have it change based on the GPU activity. You could have it change based on some other item and maybe uh, uh, GPU usage, something like that. Um, so that's, that, that's pretty cool. cool. That's, but that's, that's also kind of like a show board that was made by NVIDIA, right? Is that actually well, being shipped by anyone? It's that, this, that this, like this exact now. card will be, this is the only 690 that will exist, right? So this is going to be, there's a thousand dollar GPU, right? So um, they, they're not going to sell a ton of these and they want to make sure that, that the 690 is just kind of like a special custom piece of hardware, right? So this is what you will be able to buy. This is it um, for, in terms of the 690. I mean, they shipped it to me, if they're showing there on the stream, they shipped it to me in a wooden crate, right? <laughs> Like, in, awesome. remember, remember last week they shipped us a crowbar and this week we knew why now is because they were shipping the graphics cards in a, in a crate. <laughs> now you won't get your, you, the users, when you buy your 690 will not get a wooden crate, unfortunately, but you will get this exact card. Um, for the outputs you can see here, uh, we have three dual link DVI connections and a mm -hmm. single link mini display port. Yeah, there we go. Um, and this means you can run NVIDIA surround three monitor gaming without having to use any adapters. And if you are using three monitors in surround mode, you can use the mini DP port for a fourth accessory display. So that's kind of nice. You don't need any accessories to get three monitor gaming up and running. Uh, what else is interesting? If you look at uh, for power requirements, it uses two eight pin power connections. Yeah, there's that picture. You see it, see it lit, lit up there uh, with the G4 sheet. So the default action is just always on. So it's pretty nice. If we, if we scroll up some, we'll see the, the pair of 8-pin power connectors. This is a 300-watt TDP graphics card, which is a <laughs> lot, but it's not as much as some previous generation dual GPU graphics cards have been. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into the power. Yeah. It's interesting to the power consumption on this board. Yeah, it does have one SLI connector, so it will support quad SLI for people that want to spend $2,000 on video cards. Um, you are welcome <laughs> to do that, NVIDIA says, right? So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice graphics card, just in terms of it, it's not super heavy. Uh, that's one of the benefits of using um, the, the aluminum and the magnesium and that kind of stuff. It has great thermal properties. The board design is 10-layer PCB, which is typically 8-layer on other cards. Um, you know, higher uh, amount of copper in the traces and, and that kind of stuff. It's, it's really nice. It's, it's very quiet, and uh, I'm really impressed with the build quality. Of the GPU. Now, people admit, will see that I mentioned it was a thousand dollars. So, what kind of performance do you get for that? And it's really, really close to uh, the actual performance of two GTX 680s running an SLI, which is kind of the idea. These, this is two GK 104, two GTX 680 GPUs on a single PCB, running at just slightly lower clock speeds than uh, the standard GTX 680. These these so GPUs you just happen to be binned so that they can operate at those clock speeds. Uh, on lower voltage, using less power, less leakage, so then they have less heat they need to get out of the card uh, at, at that at that clock speed. That's a big deal because then you're talking about actually having the performance of two GTX 680s, which it turns out you actually can find uh, at yep. least on Amazon this week. Uh, not new eggs out, Amazon's in. I feel oh, really? Okay. Yeah, well, it, the the search I did for GTX 680, uh, none in stock on new egg, but they do seem to have them in stock on Amazon.com in a big way. Um, but you're looking at like 650, 680 bucks for these for an individual 680. So if you were thinking, if you are so unhinged that you you know you're running multi monitor gaming or 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 you need all the frames, if you need the highest frame rate possible, it'll actually save you money to run run of these uh, to run a 690 compared to running. Uh, Pending, we can find these. I haven't seen them for sale yet today. They're supposed to be yeah. on sale in very limited quantities today. And then apparently more will be arriving on May 7th. Um, and, and one of the things to keep note is these cards are kind of boutique graphics cards, right? And they tend to end up in boutique systems as well. So your Alienware systems, your Main Gear systems, your Falcon systems, uh, those types of things. So I think a lot of those will, will end up there. Um, 
It looks like the EVGA 690 was listed on Newegg for $1,199, not $999, uh, but it's out of stock. That's unfortunate, a, 200, a 20% markup on that, but hopefully that will come down. Um, other interesting information about the 690, it uh, operates at less power than a pair of 680s. Um, and if you, what's, what's what I th- actually, what, what I think is most interesting is if you compare the 690 to the 590, if you compare the 690 to the 6990 from AMD, those are both last generation's dual GPU graphics cards. When the 590 came out, it was based on the 580, but it was actually running 27% lower clocked processors. 27%. This case, we're only talking about 4%. So the performance of a 690 is mm-hmm. 50 to 70% better than a 590. And it's doing so while using about 40 watts less power than the 590 did. So that gives you an idea of, uh, of the improvement in efficiency in the design, uh, the 20 nanometer process, uh, those types of things, going from the 580 to the 680 and, and what that actually means to the end consumer. It means you can get a 690 if you can find one and if you can afford one. And it's, it's not going to be obnoxiously loud. It's not going to be huge. This is an 11-inch PCB, it's not that much bigger uh, than a standard single card 680. Um, and it's not going to, you know, consume 450 watts of power to get the job done, right? And that's, that's actually maybe a bigger story than just the performance of it on its own. It's, you kind of knew it was going to be, if it's close to two 680s, it's going to be the fastest single graphics card in the world. And it, and it definitely is that. But the fact that they can do it with the power efficiency that they have um, puts AMD into an interesting spot because AMD's dual card was supposed to be out first, and now uh, it was delayed for whatever reason. Now, now that the 690 has come out, they're uh, in the unfortunate position of do they still release a dual GPU card that uses more power and is less um, it has lower performance? Can they discount it enough to make it a, a, a worthwhile investment for kind of the enthusiast gamer? So there, there, are, there are some questions there. There you have it. Are you excited? I am. I th- I'm, they had a second. The, so some people from NVIDIA were in here today. We did our live stream event this morning. And they had two other 690s with them. I tried desperately to accidentally lose one so we could do our quad SLI testing um, tonight. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, they took it back from me every time I tried to grab it. I promised I would ship it, ship it to them overnight. And it would probably be there um, by the time they got home back to California, but they didn't believe me. So we'll have to wait a little bit for the quad SLI testing. I mean, so it's, cool. it's, it's so cool to test and to use, but I realize that so few people are going to spend $1,000 on a graphics card. But this is, the, this is the, 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 the fringe stuff that's pretty exciting. It's pretty, you know, wow, this is cool. I mean, it's got a controllable LED. It's got chromium plating. It's got magnesium. It's not just plastic case in a graphics card there's some sex appeal to it as well which doesn't happen too terribly often in the world of hardware there you have it so it's it's interesting because while we're looking at the the 690 which is beyond over the top for most people a thousand dollars 680 availability seems to be back at least on amazon.com like 680 bucks and then a quote cheaper gtx 670 gpu spotted at malaysian retailer um and uh, the article up on PCPro.com, it seems like MSI has some cheaper Kepler-based NVIDIA graphics card coming soon if this photo from Malaysian retailer Psycom turns out to be legit. Spotted by Loyat user Chapri, the photo appears to be an MSI GTX 670 GPU. Further, the card appeared on the company's website at a price of 1,399 Malaysian ringgits, which translates to just under $462 in the United States. Interestingly, quote, the box contains a typo for display port. Yeah, I think that's the best part. Dispoly port with an inner cap on the P. I'm, w- I'm <laughs> actually waiting for that new connection type to come out because... Dispoly port? A Dispoly port, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a Bollywood movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Bollywood sci-fi meets GPUs. Um, you know, it, so basically the question is, is this a leak of a part that's coming down the pike line shortly or is it uh a, a, a ripoff uh a terrible terrible ripoff that some <laughs> human being just found out about uh, so uh, w- while they were here i asked the, you know i asked them about that on the live stream so they couldn't just jump out of the out of the question they had to answer <laughs> it publicly in some fashion or the other and they basically came to this to the conclusion that well it would make a lot of sense if we were going to make it 670 but they obviously wouldn't say about when now 
I've been in the business a long time. When you start seeing boxes and you start seeing them for sale at Malaysian retailers, they're probably pretty close to availability. Right. And uh, it's nice. I think, you know, the, the $499, $499 GTX 680 and now the $1,000 GTX 690 are great cards and they're just top of the line enthusiast options. But I think a lot of our listeners, a lot of our viewers are really waiting on that $300 part, that $200 part, maybe even that $400 part to really round out the, 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 the Kepler line. And not just because they're NVIDIA fanboys, they just want to see what the differences are before they go spend their money. Should they get a 7800 card? Should they get a 7950? Should they wait for a 670? And these aren't questions we can answer until we actually have kind of all of our options out on the table. Then we can say, this is your best card for 200. This is your best card for 300 and go on from there. So uh, hopefully we'll see it soon. There you have it. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Panasonic and NHK were showing off a ginormous. Uh, this is a classic technology demo. One of the funny things about CES 2012 earlier this year was that there wasn't a new world's biggest plasma display. It's usually one of the things we, we look at for fun at CES is, you know, 113 inches, 122 inches. Well, Panasonic and NHK got together to show off something completely unhinged. Uh, Tim Berry over at PCPro found this uh, at Tom's, a link off of Tom's hardware, a 145-inch plasma with an 8K resolution. Uh, that would be 7,680 pixels by 4,320 pixels. And yes, it does conform to the ultra-high definition spec. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's a 16 by 9 ratio, 60 hertz refresh rate. Pixel pitch is uh, 0.417 millimeters horizontal and vertical. Uh, and... It's interesting. Video demonstration by Dig Info. Uh, the company's reported that the TV uses a new method for updating the pixels that eliminates flickering. Such flicker that would normally be caused by the TV updating the picture at 60 hertz and having to update 4,320 vertical lines of pixels. That's a lot of updates to make. <laughs> at 60 hertz yeah. suddenly really slow when you're looking at that many pixels. Um, it's going to be at the SID International Symposium for June 3rd to June 8th, the Institute of Technology from May 24th to 27th. Uh, and I'm really curious to see if it makes it over the United States. Robert Heron would freak seeing this. <laughs> yeah. um, because 4K, you know, because that was kind of like a lot of, as the 3D became popular uh, uh, in the HD side of things, the home theater side of things, uh, uh, a lot of a lot of serious video files were like, we don't need 3D, we need 4K televisions and 4K content. So I think it'll be really interesting. To see. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see it. I'm not holding my breath because 1080p, no. even at 100 inches with my projector, 1080p looks pretty fantastic. Somebody, um, somebody in the comments said, uh, the irony of trying to watch a video of an 8K resolution plasma TV with 720p content on YouTube all while getting pauses is not lost on me. <laughs> We're talking about if they were going to uh, you know, integrate their uh, web-connected features on a TV like this. So you can watch your 720p YouTube videos on it. It would be pretty it's hilarious. Funny. In the chat room, Echo Echo is like, how do you even drive an 8K display? I don't even think SDI has enough bandwidth. Actually, the, the issue is more capturing uh, the video. Creating 8K video is going to be a lot more problematic than streaming 8K video from like, you know, little blu-ray player suddenly becomes passe right from whatever your source is your your purple ray device or your super amazing hope theater pc i think the issue is less getting the video uh getting the video from whatever your your content uh source is to the 8k screen i think it's going to be a much less difficult problem to solve uh bandwidth wise than looking at what exactly it's going to take storage wise to capture 8k video um that would that would be like, you know, I, I could see like 30 second drive changes when you're shooting a feature movie or something. <laughs> that would just be really, really bad. <laughs> You've got a guy, we've got a new position in the film industry. It is the hard drive swapper. The hard drive swapper. That's uh, a heavy, heavy job, especially on the IMAX rigs. Uh, should we talk about the toughest SSD on the planet? Or is that just I had not heard, I had not, I had not rig? seen this yet, but yeah, definitely. It, it popped up on the feed really late. Um, it's kind of funny. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of the IOSafe Rugged Portable, uh, which you haven't seen at IOSafe.com. Uh, Rugged Portable is essentially they do traditional rotating media and then a ridiculously bomb-proof uh, enclosure for an SSD. And essentially, as near as I can tell, they, they take a hard drive, they enclose it in a polymer, then they glue the polymer, the drive inside the polymer inside of an aluminum case. Uh, I've thrown it. I've dropped it. I've seen them hit by, you know, a megawatt 
of voltage. Uh, it's waterproof. Uh, it, 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 you can melt it. You can cut it in half. Um, but it's you know it's USB 3.0 and an SSD is ridiculously fast. Not cheap. Um, mm-hmm. But if the kind of person likes to drag their hard drive behind their truck, this is your hard drive. So then I saw the toughest hard, the toughest SSD on the planet, and it's really interesting. Uh, Telecommunication Systems, which is a name nobody on this podcast outside of maybe some people working in uh, military communications is going to recognize. It's the Galatea Ultra Rugged SSD. So essentially, it's it rolls it's, off the tongue, doesn't it? Rolls right off the top. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the the mill standard A10 military specifications governing a multitude of ultra recognized requirements. This SSD is designed for ultimate reliability in the harshest of environments. Designed and tested with the most hostile environments imaginable in mind, these SSDs are surely among the toughest storage mediums available. Um, so, if you go to SSD review and click on the link, it's essentially uh, a mill spec ultra rugged SLC SSD. So, traditional sort of military technology, a little bit trailing the. Uh, the latest and greatest uh, tech mm-hmm. out there. But yeah. the idea is that it's going to be pretty abuse-proof uh, in a way that even a... Because traditional SSDs are really hard to kill. Um, but this is essentially like a Sandforce SF1565 controller, which is not exactly bleeding edge. Uh, but it's no, still it's got be, fairly low read-write speeds and IOPS and that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but the yeah. idea is they're talking about like a mean time between failure of 1.45 million hours, data retention of 10 years, uh, crypto and flash for quote, enhanced security erase methods, uh, AES 128 built in. So it'll be interesting. Uh, and 20,000 terabyte lifetime write capacity. So I suspect this thing is going to be profoundly expensive. I like what the, uh, the uh, ssdreview.com people's in their conclusion this was definitely a fun departure from our standard ssd reviews and allowed us to delve a bit into the differences between the ruggedized sector and the standard ssds we are accustomed to te- testing um so it's pretty interesting looking at it essentially it's a very rugged case and a ruggedized design tantalum based capacitors are key to providing reliable performance in hot environments and protect the data on the ssd uh, underville staking basically underville and staking they support the components on the drive inside the enclosure um you know it's pretty cool um it's pretty cool uh, i'm afraid to find the uh the cost of it because this is something it's yeah, designed don't bother. To be deployed in uh uh, you pay for it in tax dollars only, not in real dollars. <laughs> the special tax dollars. So it's like it's like it's like not even real money. I heard someplace. So hey, let's take a quick break here before we get into the rest of our stories and thank the first of today's episode sponsors. That would be Squarespace. Everybody, Squarespace is back. The fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. They have uh, we, we've talked about them before. It's been a little while, but you you guys should know who these people are. They have an easy-to-use UI for creating and managing a website or blog. They recently started giving out, this is actually pretty cool, they recently started giving out free domains to all annual plan customers so that, you ne- so that you never have to pay for a domain or worry about hosting it. It's all conveniently integrated when you sign up and requires zero configuration uh, by making all the domain selection and mapping completely seamless, which is really cool. And if you decide to cancel the service, you still get to keep the domain. So that's, you know, you're not giving them the rights to it if you have a pretty cool idea as well, which is, I think it's important to, to keep in mind. They have a simplified its subscription plans to provide reduced pricing as well. They now have a standard plan starting as low as $8 a month. So if you have been looking to start a website about PC hardware, uh, ruggedized SSDs, uh, 4K display panels, 8K display panels, you can absolutely do that for as low as $8 a month. You can do it for, for any number of reasons, business reasons, personal reasons, family blogs, all that kind of stuff. You can do any of that with Squarespace. It's optimized for both beginners and experts. It's got a friendly CSS editor editor um, that allows you to pop out the entire window in full screen, colorize, code, undo, find, and replace. That's actually really cool. Hundreds of design templates to choose from, and you can start with one of those and then customize it from there. Um, they do have iPhone, iPad, Android apps for updating your blog on the go. Google's completely web, uh, I'm sorry, Google's complete web font library. Over 300 fonts are now completely integrated, which is that's nice as well. Online resources and a special support team give you help 24-7. They offer free live webinar classes to help you get the most out of your Squarespace blogs. They're not just going to take your $8 a month and leave you empty-handed. They're going to help you learn how to use the service and help you learn how to make better websites. It's very cool. They have blog modules, form builders, Flickr photo displays, Twitter widgets, 
social media buttons, Google Maps integrations. They have website tracking and stats so you know who's coming to your site, where they're coming from, how, if your traffic is growing and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's really cool. Cloud architecture for speed and site stability and about your site going down. Uh, if you should get a lot of traffic, if you should get post on Slashdot or Reddit or whatever it is these days. Um, so you can, you can and should use Squarespace for all of your website needs. Build it, host it, and update it anytime. For a free trial, here's what we want you to do. We want you to go to squarespace.com. Sign up for a free account. There's no credit card needed. Just try it out and start building your website. You can do it really, really, really quickly. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the shows, I'm not that creative, I guess, they actually will create a website while they're talking about the commercial. It, it, it is that quick and easy to do. Um, then if you decide to purchase it, use offer code TWITCH5, T-W-I-C-H-5, and you'll get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. And don't forget about the free uh, domain registration with annual subscriptions. So with this deal going on now, you can use the offer code TWITCH5 at squarespace.com TWICH5, you'll get 10% off of your new accounts and free domain still. So uh, it's definitely worth checking out if you have any desire to build a website for any purpose. If you want to show off your photos, talk, start a blog, do even if you have a small business and you want to start something, check out squarespace.com. Uh, we really appreciate their support and uh, we are looking forward to seeing what you guys build with the tools. Woohoo! Shall we move on to the, the, the next stories in line? What do we got here? Alienware updating a laptop lineup with Ivy Bridge That's processors. So this is kind of a quick thing, but we get emails all the time. Hey, I've been, I was waiting on Ivy Bridge uh, processors before I upgraded my laptop. Um, you know, what about gaming machines? Th this, this kind of answers a lot of those questions, right? So the Alienware M14X, the M17X, and even the Behemoth M18X have been upgraded with the Ivy Bridge processors. That's... That's actually nice. Um, let's see. I, I'm, I'm really interested in the M14X now. The M14X with the Ivy Bridge with uh, some discrete Kepler graphics going on in there could be a, a really, really nice system. Um, the M11X, unfortunately, is still, still dead. It, it did not get brought back to life with the Ivy Bridge pro, uh, platform release, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so the M14X now comes with a standard Kepler GT650M discrete graphics solution. Uh, and you can go all the way up to uh, 675M or Radeon 7970M on the M17X. And then with the M18X, you can do SLI 675Ms or Crossfire Radeon 7970M. So if you want just more than desktop capable gaming capability, the M18X will let you do dual GPUs and that kind of deal. The M14X, I think, is is is, is pretty interesting uh, from a cost standpoint and from a, the capability standpoint. I know, I know, uh, we, we've talked about these a lot before, but uh, I, I think I think these these machines worth worth looking at. Some people don't like the stylized stuff. I, I don't mind it. What about you, Patrick? I think it's gonna be interesting to watch. You know, I, I I'm with you. I'm like, look, where did the M11X go? When is going to be coming back? Um, I thought it was kind of it's kind of funny to watch the refreshes going around um, whether or not you know it's it's interesting watching you know several major vendors that are waiting um, till later this basically been waiting until later this year to flip the switch on the Ivy Bridge. Uh, it's interesting seeing who's going to be actually running uh, both the older CPUs and the Ivy Bridge CPUs simultaneously, which is a little odd to me. Um, Mm -hmm. But mostly, though, I'm with you. I want the ML of an X back. <laughs> I, I heard that they might uh, be rebranding it as an Ultrabook, like an Alienware Ultrabook, coming really? out. Like they're going to try to, they're going to try to do that. That's that's a rumor I heard somewhere. Don't tell anybody I told you that. Okay, this is just between you and I. <laughs> you and I and our friends. Exactly. I it was pretty interesting. The uh, the GeForce Experience Cloud Service. Uh, which was the, the next story on the list. It, the idea mm -hmm. that you can actually have an application uh, or a service that'll look at your system, look at the game, and then automatically recommend, based on your hardware configuration, automatically recommend the best possible settings for the best quality uh, on the game. And it's kind of interesting. Will, will, will there be a slider that lets you decide, like, do I want higher frame rates for better gaming uh, experience in my Twitch games? Or is it automatically going to... Uh, is it automatically going to do things to make the, the visuals I think look the best? It could still change. The versions I have seen um, basically are 
just apply settings, right? So the, the, the scope of it is really impressive when you think about what they're trying to do. They're, they're not just looking at what graphics card you have. Uh, they're actually looking at your graphics card, your processor, how much memory you have, uh, what storage you use, anything that might affect gaming performance. They are actually looking at in this service. They're analyzing it. And they, so they have this, this, this test facility uh, that does highly automated testing with thousands and thousands of systems in, in Moscow, I think, actually. This is kind of a project they've been working on for a long time, is the ability to do this. Because what, you know, they, they, NVIDIA will thrive if PC gaming thrives. And one of the ways they could do that is just by trying to improve the gaming ecosystem as a whole. Right now, obviously, they're trying to do it with their NVIDIA brand on it and calling it the GeForce experience. But the idea is when you put in a game in your console, you don't have to worry about setting what uh, shadow quality is the best. You don't have to worry about, do I want to run in DX11 or DX9 mode in this particular one? Uh, what kind of water detail levels do I want? You know, you don't have to do that. Now, PCs, you don't have to do that either. You can kind of take the default, but most of the time the default is pretty crappy because the software developer is not really spending a whole lot of time uh, trying to make sure that works. And even if they do spend a good amount of time, like Valve has done in the past, that kind of stuff gets outdated. So what NVIDIA wants is to bring that same kind of quick experience to PC gamers by you download the tool. Maybe it's included in the driver. I don't really know. And it searches your hard drive for all the games you've got installed. And it says, downloads data from the, from the cloud. Like, here's what, sir, here's what settings we recommend. Would you like us to apply them? And you can hit yes. And you don't have to go into the game and fiddle with anything. It's just it goes in a config file and does all that stuff for you. And next time you start your game, it, it is set up uh, in an easier way. Now, you can still go in and edit things. I don't want people who, who like to tinker to, to get aggravated by this. But the idea is, even for those guys, I think it's a great idea to have a starting point. Here's what NVIDIA said. Well, let me play it for a little bit. Nah, I would rather have a little bit higher frame rate, so I'll turn down this and this. Or maybe I would rather see better image quality, and I think the frame rate is more than enough, so I'll turn up this and this, right? And it gives you less knobs that you necessarily have to change to get started. Uh, I, I think it's a really good idea. Um, I, I, they, they announced it uh, at the same time they discussed the 690 and said that the beta testing was going to start in June, which is less than a month away now. So uh, end users will, will get their hands on this. It sounds like pretty soon. And we'll see if it works at all, I guess. <laughs> I mean, do, do you like the idea, Patrick, of kind of taking that console-centric mindset of plug and play to the, to, the, to the PC world? I know there are some people that think of it as like sacrilege to, to, to not be able to, to not have to go in and tinker with everything to your heart's content, I guess. But, you know, if they, if, if they do that and strip away the opportunity to go deep into the con, you know, it, it's kind of funny because I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a desktop monitor connected to a notebook and I was about to basically pull up, um, you know, the, the, the configure, display configuration settings so I can get my nerd on and read off some of the more obscure devices. I think for a lot yeah. of people, <laughs> what I'm taking too long to say is I think for a lot of people, uh, they want to play the delete exploit of game. They don't want to twiddle, you know, mm -hmm. with 14 variations of anti-aliasing settings until they find right. something that looks really good on their monitor. Um, you know, for the people like you or me who may actually enjoy spending an evening twittering around with, with obscure settings inside. I'm not going to lie. I don't, I don't like doing it. I don't, uh, I don't think it's fun to like, cause that's, but that's the normal process that I go through, right? We get a new game in. It's like, well, let's see if we can use this for benchmarking and testing. And people say, well, all you do is sit around and play games. Well, really what I did all that day was spend three hours at the office testing all these different settings. Well, if I enable depth of field, how does it affect performance throughout the game? Right. And if I, Oh, well that, that, just totally destroyed this card. Okay, well, now if I enable high-quality shadows instead of medium-quality shadows or low-quality shadows, how does that affect the performance, right? You know, and, and just as a, maybe more so than a user that's just going to play the game, we're trying to look for ways to compare uh, graphics architectures and that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, it's, I think it would be a benefit to even have a starting point, right? And, and then go from there. Um, you know, w this won't work with AMD graphics cards, uh, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> So will they come up with something similar? Will they not have the resources or capability? Because this, this has been a project that's been worked on for a long time. It's not something they just figured out how to do. Uh, because the permutations of all the settings in each game, along with each processor, each graphics card, each memory configuration is pretty intense. 
So, uh, but we'll be able to we'll be able to test it soon. We'll be able we'll, we will know soon enough. <laughs> soon also will probably be the death of the atom processor. Um, <laughs> in what I think maybe the cruelest headline I've read in a really long time. Dying atoms, the failure of low-power x86 processors. And I, I think it's safe to, to summarize this article uh, in that Atom was an interesting idea. Nobody ever enjoyed running an Atom machine if they'd ever run a faster processor. Uh, Intel has basically hammered nails in the coffin of the Atom CPU um, by developing, uh, amongst other things, the Ultrabook spec. Um, and... You know, uh, whatever hope for these low-power, low-performance processors might have remained in terms of sort of, uh, uh, you know, automated devices or Blu-ray players or set-top boxes yeah. seems to have pretty much been wiped out by the ARM architecture. Uh, not to oversimplify, but I, I think the article is pretty much Adam's dead and nobody cares. <laughs> it's, I, it's not well, just it was too in, It was interesting... Well, I was going to say your, your first comment is like nobody enjoyed using this devices. It was interesting because we had this discussion last night and I think people thought they enjoyed using this devices, these, de these kinds of devices, netbooks and that kind of stuff, because it was a completely new form factor than we had ever seen before. I think we were more in love with the idea of this tiny computer that is also tiny in price with 199 bucks, 299 bucks. You know, that's, that's when the first Asus EPCs came out. Um, they, were, they, they weren't even running Windows. Remember, they were running a Linux kind of skinned Linux operating system that was just atrocious for anything but just standard web browsing, right? And I think what happened is over the last five years, it's been almost exactly five years since the first EPC was released, and uh, the last EPC or the last uh, ASUS netbook was officially released and, and being sold. We, we found that users were like, yeah, you know what? This hasn't gotten any better since five years ago. That was kind of the problem is the Atom product line stayed stayed pretty stagnant in terms of performance capabilities. Um, they didn't, they, they iterated, but they didn't iterate well enough Intel. So it, it, it got, why, I mean, who, who would buy an, an Atom based netbook today? Hopefully nobody. And AMD did a pretty good job with their Brazos trying to increase GPU performance, increase CPU performance a little bit uh, in that kind of form factor, but it still wasn't amazing. So what we're hoping is we see, um, Ivy Bridge, and then Haswell architecture after that, truly be able to bring the same CPU subset down to these lower price points, right? It's all going to be on what Intel decides they want to do with pricing. Are they, are they willing to sell the same architecture at $299 as they are at $599 as they are at $1999? That's a pretty big risk for them, right? Because if people start to realize that the $399 machine really does everything they need to do, why do they need a $1,000 machine? Why do they need that $1,000 processor? It, it's going to screw with their with their markets, right? And that's that's why Adam has been where it is and why it's been so stagnant for so long. So the, the editorial that Matt wrote up is actually really, really, really good. I I would hope people would would go give it a read because it's 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 much more complex subject than we have time to to discuss necessarily. Um, but it it's it's a very pertinent discussion based on all the stuff that's going on in the, the mobile computing worlds. So. And, and I should probably point out, as, as some of the commenters uh, said on the article, um, they're actually not bad for basic computing, especially. Uh oh, we have a frozen Patrick. I think what he was going to say was it. <laughs> oh, there he is. He's back. It, it, it's, you were saying that the atom processor wasn't bad for something. I, I thought it was it was funny is one of the first uh, persons that commented on the article was like, hey, I've been using, you know, my my, you know, the, I have to defend the NC 10 a bit here. I've used one for about three and a half years It's my only portable with a desktop to handle some more CPU hungry tasks. And it's interesting. The guy's like, hey, if, if you're only using it for basic, you know, features, uh, it's you're not going to be bothered by it. I'm happy with it. It's cheap. And when I when I need to replace yeah. it. Uh, I spent 300 bucks on it, not like 800 pounds. So, uh, you know, Fair good, good point. It's good enough for what it does. I will not miss it, though. <laughs> I will not. We should take a moment to thank our friends over at Netflix, our second sponsor in the episode. That's right, everybody. This episode. Oh, go ahead. 
Oh, no, I was going to say it was in, in my favorite streaming video service. I love Netflix. I was watching. I do too. You know, one of the things uh, that you find when you're moving is sometimes you don't have access to the devices and the content that you're used to having. So when you want to waste time, you can't just flip on a TV uh, and maybe you're, you know, that, that's the installer's not coming for a while. So what do you do? You got Netflix app on your iPad. Boom. Instant entertainment for you or a loved one or a whole family of loved ones. Keep that in mind. So Netflix is a streaming video service. It will stream thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. You don't have to go to the video store. You don't have to go to the grocery store. You don't have to worry about returning things or being late or paying a dollar or whatever it is. Uh, and the best part is there's lots of ways to get Netflix. You can uh, watch Netflix movies on your Mac, your PC, your iPad, your iPhone, your Android phones now have Netflix application support. Uh, if you have a gaming console like an Xbox 360, PS3, or Nintendo Wii, all of those support streaming Netflix. So if they're internet connected, you can use Netflix for that. Uh, you can use a Roku box. You can use an Apple TV. Most of these devices that, that are being sold now, Blu-ray players, DVD players, TVs themselves will have these streaming Netflix applications already embedded in it. So you might already have access to Netflix uh, without even knowing it, in which case our offer to you is going to be amazing. We want you to try Netflix free for 30 days on the, any of these devices. You know, you can try it out on just your iPad. You can try it out on just your Xbox 360 or whatever it is. Or you can try it out on all of them to really see the, the benefits of this kind of cross-platform compatibility, which so few things in life really do well. Netflix.com slash twit is the URL we want you to use. That's where you go to get your free 30-day trial. You can try it out. You can watch unlimited uh, movies and TV shows. You can watch them an unlimited number of times in this trial. You know, it's starting at only $7.99 a month for this. So even after 30 days, uh, which I really think are going to enjoy the service, you can cancel at any time and you won't have to pay. But I really, really, really think you're going to like uh, what you're able to get with this. They're adding new content all the time. Uh, I think, did I read this right? They're, we're even getting more um, specific content to Netflix, like uh, only on Netflix type availability of content as well for some upcoming TV shows. So uh, there's, there's always excitement boiling around Netflix. Again, that URL is netflix.com slash twit. And we thank them for their continued support of This Week in Computer Hardware and the entire Twit network. So you think uh, we got some time for some emails? I should point out, we need your questions still. Keep sending them in. Twitch at twit.tv, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. That is the email address where you can submit your points of discussion. You can ask questions. You can point out where we got things wrong, add into discussions <laughs> that we've already had. Uh, we welcome all of that, but twitch at twit.tv. So uh, you want to take our first question, Patrick? Absolutely. We got a question actually about iPad heat issues. Uh, we got uh, <laughs> Ryan, first thing, huge fan. There's been some issues thrown around about heat in the new iPad or the iPad 3, depending on how you want to label it. I never noticed any significant temperatures until I paused the video on the Netflix app while charging it, and it got super hot, almost so hot you can't hold it. I got a coworker here that has an iPad 2, and she was horrified at the temperature. Perhaps all the complainers were charging them while using them, and I didn't mention it, or they didn't mention it, pardon me. Maybe the user guide says somewhere they can't use it while charging. Just thought you might want to know my discovery. By the way, this is the first Apple-branded device I've ever owned. Still finding it hard to do any business on it, though. Great entertainment device, writes Darren. And uh, it's funny, uh, we, we didn't have a chance to get to this question uh, uh, last week. And it's funny because this was, I, I'm going to chalk this up to, yes, it is hot. Um, it is not the hottest device out there, but there was a no. big, giant frenzy on the Internet over this. And, uh, you know, PC World said not so hot. The new iPad heat levels are comparable to Android tablets. Uh, uh, Melissa J. Perrinson is a pretty solid writer over at PC World. Said so much for heat gate. Uh, but they looked at the Asus ePad Transformer Prime, the LT version of the, the Samsung Galaxy Tab 10.1. Um, and they basically took an infrared thermometer, which if you haven't seen, it's a it's sort of a gun-shaped thermometer where you point it and uh, it, it gives you a reach temperature off the surface of the device. And they looked at it. So it's kind of funny because it's this great chart up at PCWorld.com. And I think we've got a link to it in the show notes um, where you look at, uh, you know, after playing a game for an hour... Uh, after playing for one hour maxing out uh, with reading on the back, uh, under battery power versus plugged in. And 
in their cases, the new iPad ran between five and seven Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the iPad 2. Um, but I wonder what application they were looking at. Because if you look at uh, – because they, they were getting like 100 degrees. Consumer Reports – Tests found that the new iPad hit 116 degrees while running games. Um, and uh, so they were saying the new iPad gets up to 13 degrees hotter than the iPad 2. Um, and then they did a follow-up article over at Consumer Reports, iPad heats, how hot is too hot, and other FAQs. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, they said they ran their tests in a room with an ambient temperature of 72 degrees, which is an optimal condition for operating the tablets. Uh, they don't really know whether or not these elevated heat levels are going to damage the device in the long run. Uh, you know, Apple says it, it's the I, new iPad's operating well within its thermal envelope. Because uh, the truth is, is, is silicon and, and surface mount components can operate at, at temperatures that are, are really unpleasant for human beings. Um, and uh, you know, Consumer Reports is actually trying to decide whether or not they're going to do this kind of testing for tablets, uh, upcoming tablets from other vendors. Um, because they looked at it, uh, the Consumer Reports sort of threshold for damage um, is that if a, a laptop heats up to 120 degrees or more, it could damage bare skin over time, as in a lot of time. Um, and, quote, uh, they dis Consumer Reports discontinued our heat test several years ago when typical temperatures came down to 110 degrees Fahrenheit or so. So they're basically... You know, even at 116 degrees, Consumer Reports says it's uncomfortable, uh, but it's not going to hurt you. So, but it's kind of funny, like 116 degrees is pretty hot, but it's not like boiling water, you know, McDonald's coffee hot. Um, so, you know, uh, it, if, if you are concerned about, uh, you know, I, I certainly, if I was thinking about having kids, probably wouldn't want to put it on my lap while gaming and charging at <laughs> the same. Fair enough. Uh, humorous, but. Uh, I thought that was really interesting to look at uh, kind of a, you know, hundred another yeah. four degrees and then you're looking at damage. But 116 degrees or less, uh, your skin should be safe. <laughs> well, that's pleasant. Uh, let's go. Uh, we've got an email here from uh, Jeremy about emails. He says, uh, the last few podcasts I've heard you guys asking when the cheap 1440p monitors would be here. And have been meaning to write in, uh, but just got around to it. Currently on eBay, there are several resellers listing 27-inch 1440p monitors for around $350 shipped. I've had one of uh, the Cat Leap, am I reading that right? Cat Leap models, <laughs> okay, for about a month now and have been incredibly happy with it. Apparently, these monitors are available in South Korea for around $250. And so people are just reselling them on eBay for the people like us in the States craving them. The only real issue seems to be questions surrounding warranty, support, and shipping costs and returns. But for the price, it's really hard to complain. Have you seen any of these, Patrick? Uh, I, and, and what is a cat leap? That is uh, something else I'm going to look at. Here, I'm going to I'm going to drop a, a link we can we can put in the video feed there uh, in okay. the show notes. And it's interesting because you search for like 2560 by 1440 uh, monitor, and you, there's like 214 results. Uh, there's the crossover. Uh, is one of the brands, Perfect Pixel, Yamakasi, Achiva. Um, and it's one of those things where I would be more comfortable if, if remember computer shows? <laughs> they were kind of like you, yeah. You'd go to the sort of, you know, you'd, you'd go to the fairgrounds, people would be selling parts. Um, Achiva Shimian, uh, that's another one. The 3D yep. piece bank. But basically, what you have here is a lot of vendors you've never heard of, um, or a lot of. Uh, piece or or, or uh, monitor vendors you've never heard of, um, and you know you, this is one of those things where you know you take a risk. You know, is the uh, you know the first Same one on the list? list it's the crossover twenty seven Q LED, the Dream Dash seller is ninety eight point nine percent positive feedback. Um, you know, I'm looking yeah, down. I'm, so, I'm curious yeah. now because I'm looking at them on eBay. This Achieva Shimian. Uh, you know, basically, if you have more than one dead pixel in the center, they consider it faulty. You need five dead pixels in the other areas to be considered faulty. Um, you know, they. Uh, it's. I think it's interesting that that they will not send you uh, a specific serial number <laughs> if you ask for that. Um, the plug type is C for Korea, so you need to have a multi plug or voltage transformer for your country plug type and voltage, uh, which should be an issue because at this point it says. Uh, it's a 220 volt 
monitor for this one. So that could be an issue for a lot of people. Um, you know, this is this is an interesting thing. Like, let's check the perfect pixel. How many volts is it running on? Uh, you know, finding a 220 volt transformer is kind of a PITA. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, look, worldwide universal adapter is a free gift with the perfect pixel monitor. Ooh, um, which is again also very Korean. Uh, you know, so you're not going to be reading the specs on this, <laughs> right? Yes. Unless you don't read the back of the box. So you know, this is. I think this is one of those things where I'd 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 be I'd look for vendors that uh, had a really good reputation, and I'd look for a return policy that didn't seem too onerous. Um, or I'd wait for more mainstream vendors to come down in price. I don't like to waste that. You know. <laughs> yeah, 220 volts is going to be, you know, you're definitely going to need a, uh, a universal. You, you're going to need, if you need a transformer for that, uh, you, you might want to see if they'll bundle one with the device. I think it's interesting. It's, a, it, you know, it's definitely something to consider. I feel like this is something we should try. I feel like this is, uh, this is right up our alley. So. <laughs> I am tempted. The, the new Yamakaze cat. There it is. There's the cat leap. I found the cat leap. <laughs> I'm kind of tempted to. If, if I can't you know, own a monitor that says cat leap. Does it say? Oh, it says Yamakaze. Oh, it says cat leap in the upper left-hand corner. I'm very okay. excited. I, you know, uh, I wonder if I can buy one of these without my wife killing me. Yeah, well, it's uh, for work. It's for you work. Bought by Discovery. What's a cat leap? <laughs> What's well, a cat leap between friends? It's a cat leap between friends. Come on. Have it. Well, I uh <laughs> let's let's see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll see. I want to take uh, uh another email here. Should we talk about uh, memory limits or 32 gigs sure. of visualization home lab? Uh, uh your email from Brandon. Okay. Uh, Brandon's got an email about memory limits. He says, love the show. Thank you, Brandon. I'm currently running an EVGA 790i SLI <laughs> for the win FTW motherboard with six gigs of DDR3 memory. I've looked at all the documentation for my motherboard and the firmware release history for my motherboard and cannot find written support for more than eight gigs of memory. The motherboard has four slots. The user's manual states that it can support up to two gigabytes per slot. When I purchased the motherboard, the largest available memory was two gigabyte sticks. I now see eight gig sticks available. Is eight gigabytes a real limitation for the 790i chipset? Or is it that support was based on what was available during the release of the motherboard? Before I sink three hundred dollars into thirty-two gigabytes of RAM, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is so. This is the LGA seventy seventy-five chipset. I had to go look it up. It's been a long time. It's Actually, I think I have a motherboard, but the processor. I have this exact motherboard in the back room with the processor really? still installed. Um, <laughs> The problem, even though I know he's thinking, he's like, well, they thought two gigs was the maximum per per slot because back then there were only two gig modules. And, and that's not necessarily the case because of the memory controller. That's the limitation. It's not necessarily that those weren't there yet. Um, yeah. There's a possibility that it might recognize four gig modules, but I would somehow very much doubt it. And I, you definitely should not spend the money uh, to figure out. Now, if you have a a friend who has four gig modules that you can borrow for five minutes and see if your system boots up and recognizes all the memory. Um, that might be worth trying out, but uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that uh, you're not going to be able to support more than eight gigs of memory. And, and, and in reality, uh, you know, depending on what you're doing, if you add another, you've got six in there now, if you add another two, eight gigs is a lot of memory for just about anybody doing just about anything. If you're not doing giant unhinged video editing or working right. with like, you know, <laughs> two gigabyte photos or something like that, it's 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 interesting. I'm up on the uh, 790i uh, SLI page on NVIDIA.com. Yep. And doo -doo -doo. it's kind of funny. They don't actually, <laughs> they're specking the, the, the slots, but they're not specking the actual memory uh, right. maximum on there, which is always frustrating. Uh, Gosh darn it. NVIDIA. Well, in their it. defense, it's an old product. That's true. Yeah, this is this is a four, this is literally a a more than four year old design. So uh Pentium D, Pentium 4, Penrin, Core 2 Quad, Core 2 Extreme, Core 2 Duo. Yeah, you know what? I'd I'd Ryan's right, man. 
take your eight gigabytes and run <laughs> and, and save the cash for your for your next motherboard upgrade. Um, if you really need 32 gigabytes of RAM, it's probably time to upgrade. Yeah, if you need 32 gigs of RAM for something, chances are you need a new processor and you need to not be running on, on a socket 75, socket 775 unit too. On the so, upside, you know, memory is so cheap. Two gigabytes sticks. I was, I was introducing actually my CEO to the PCPer.com uh, leaderboard today because he's built a new gaming PC for his son. And uh, he was laughing. So I'm like, you know, wait for, you know, poach yourself a 3770K. It's going to be totally awesome. The 77 motherboard's awesome. And then he like gets to the Corsair XMS 8 gigabyte memory. And he's like, that's ridiculous. $52. That's so cheap. So I would say, uh, yeah, Brandon, uh, uh, you know, upgrade yourself to eight gigabytes of RAM for like a hundred bucks or wait until it's time to upgrade your motherboard and get your 32 gigabytes of memory then. Because the truth is most people want 32 gigabytes of memory, but don't actually have the ability to use 32 gigabytes of memory. No offense, Correct. Brandon, if you the people who can't actually take advantage of that. So we've got time for one more quick question if we go through it. In a, in a speedy fashion, let's take uh, this one from Tim. He's asking about a... Um, no, that's not the one I wanted to get. I'm sorry. We'll do Tim next week. Email from Prost. Uh, Prost about a slow PC upgrade. He says he's got a desktop computer that's driving him nuts. Uh, we are the most likely people to shed light on this. Well, let's hope so. I am giving it just the regular office internet usage, and the thing is slow during startup and opening a website or starting a program. When it is doing that... The hard drive is working all of the time, especially after logging in my Windows account. It takes almost a minute of hard drive scrubbing until my desktop is on. Even after that, the drive takes a long time settling. And while that is happening, my computer's response to anything is sluggish, to say the least. The funny thing is my old Pentium dual-core Dell machine at work, which is running Windows 7, does not do this. Here are the specs. It's an Athlon 2 X4 620 uh, AM3 770 chipset motherboard, 8 gigs of memory. HD 57, six, or 5670 graphics card, 2 terabyte standard hard drive, um, Windows 7, 64-bit, and uh, yeah, there you go. Um, his question is, would upgrade the CPU to Phenom 2 help here, or is it just another case of get an SSD or even another PC, which I'm really starting to consider? Greatly appreciate your help. Uh, Prost, which means cheers in Bavaria. Prost, so, zoom Prost. Or educating people uh, in more than just computer hardware. So <laughs> here's my thought. He, if, if you're taking more than a minute of hard drive scrubbing after you boot into Windows before things are like active, and, and it, you shouldn't have that problem. Uh, on a two terabyte hard drive, I mean, an SSD is going to be faster. And chances are it will solve this problem for him. But I don't think it's the root of the problem. It sounds to me like you've got way too much stuff running. Um, the Windows install is just kind of old and bit rot and it needs to be kind of formatted and, and re reinstalled now saying that if you do get an ssd and just mirror this over i'm guessing it will it will go much faster but i i think you can get away with this by some some kind of manual some some pc based manual labor to actually figure out what is starting what is so slow um because i mean he says himself in the email that he has an old pinium dual core dell machine that does not do this so to me, this seems like a software issue um, more than a hard or less. It's a software issue more than it is a hardware issue. And he may be lucky in that this is one of the cases where you can just throw more hardware at it and it fixes the problem as opposed to actually going in to fix the problem. So he just needs to decide kind of which way he wants to go there. Yeah, I, I agree 100% there. Somebody actually, we did this big sort of list of potential upgrades for a notebook for a user a couple weeks ago. And and one of our faithful viewers on Techzill emailed me like, dude, you're like king, just reinstall the operating system and, and make sure you don't have like four terabytes of files sitting on the, the desktop uh, right. before you spend any money. And I'm like, wow, for the first time in my life, I didn't say wipe the system, reinstall Windows, make sure your drivers are up to date. You know, and 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 to, you know, uninstall all the cruftware that you're allowing to start with the system. And I was like, oh wow, that's weird. Um, but yeah, a minute uh, to start uh, of, of 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 scrubbing uh, for your hard drive, grinding back yeah. and forth. It's just there, that's there's just, a there is a small chance there's something wrong with the hard drive, but I think it's pretty small. Um, yeah. You know. But that's, yeah, that's what I would do. Well, in which case, you back up your important files onto an external drive or, or, or an online service. Do that first. Preferably an external drive just because it's so fast. 
then, you know, reinstall Windows in your applications and, you know, try to minimize the number of things you allow to start when you boot your PC. And, you know, especially there are also going to be something weird in the background uh, uh, running that's just doing nasty things in there. But it's shocking how 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 much uh, performance you can bring back to a PC simply by unloading a lot of stuff that loads on boot, uh, mm-hmm. especially with PC. So. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Don't forget, software can make your hardware look slow. <laughs> it's not something you usually own up to on uh, on Twitch, but it's something to remember for everybody out there. Yes. So uh, any idea what's coming up on PC Per this week, or are you just I blinded have... air travel at this point? Yeah, I really – I have I have no clue what we're going to – we've got uh, we've got some malware stories we're going to talk about, kind of some misconceptions in that. We're, we've got a story going up tonight on uh, the Trinity – uh, AMD Trinity based rumors that are out there. Uh, what else do we have? We have some more 7900 series graphics card reviews that are going to come out. Josh is publishing a couple of those uh, articles. And then uh, finally, going to get back to Austin and look at some Z77 motherboards uh, individually and kind of get people prepped for what they, what they, what the better, uh, the better <laughs> and best options are for uh, your Ivy Bridge builds. Cool. And uh, how about, how about on, uh, Techzilla. I was on there earlier this week talking about Ivy Bridge. Actually, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Actually, thank you so much for doing that. That was nope. that was good. I like having the Ryan on. We've got uh, some fun stuff coming up next week. I actually got a new uh, I got a new solar powered hands free Bluetooth device. Going to be testing that. Uh, Veronica Belmont is going to be talking about when to buy a Mac. Lloyd Case is going to be guesting. I suspect talking about the six ninety uh, benchmarks, and we're talking about. Uh, either hiding your home theater gear on HD Nation or Denon's new home theater in a box, which looks fantastic for the money, uh, or perhaps uh, some of the new flat panels from LG. So that's just some of the fun we plan to bring you on the new Discovery-owned uh, Texas. <laughs> I think Sorry, under I'm every sorry. title now, it should be a Discovery product underneath there. I'm kind that's of tripping on that. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be cool. We'll see. I wonder if I get to go drinking with Mike Rowe now. Not that I drink, but I could be the designated driver. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that's it for this week in computer hardware. I'm Patrick Norton. You can find more of me at techzilla.com or hdnation.tv. Ryan Shroud, of course, when he's not traveling in the air, actually, especially even when he is traveling in the air, can be found yeah. at PC. Uh, if you're thinking about building a new PC, do yourself a favor. Check out the excellent list of parts at the PCPro.com leaderboard, uh, which is really easy to find. You can either type yeah. in pcper.com slash leaderboard or pcper.com slash HWLB. And uh, that's it for this week in computer hardware. Please tune in next week where we will be talking more about computer hardware news and answering your questions. I'm Patrick Dorn. I'm Ryan Schrapp. We'll see you next week on Twitch. <laughs>